If you want to day trade cryptocurrency, this video and mini course is for you. I'm gonna show you how to start from scratch all the way through to making trades and when and how to trade. After this video, you'll be able to trade crypto like a seasoned trader, know how to read crypto charts and analyze the market, and also how to manage your risk, which is the most important thing, and how to work out your profit and loss along the way. It's a really long video full of actionable information, so the timestamps for each section are down there in the video description. Everything else that I mentioned throughout this mini video course is down there as well, so definitely check out the description if you want more info. A very quick intro on me. I used to work on the London Stock Exchange, uh, traded stocks for many years, so I'm a former LSC broker, um, trading professionally and on my own account for more than a decade. This is not financial advice, this is just um, getting you set up and kind of the theory towards everything. Um, also, a lot of the stuff that I mentioned in this course, um, you can actually go in and learn way more in other videos that I have on YouTube. So um, specific videos I'll list in the video description, some other resources down there. Also, all of the different uh, trading tools and charting tools um, and everything like that, I'll list some of the things down there. Um, I also have a crypto investor course, which is you know much more in depth, over 150 videos. We have private Discord groups as well that you can come in, um, a few thousand people in these already. Um, you can check out the crypto investor course, I'll link it in the description, moneyzg.academy. Um, it is a complete crypto investing and trading course. Uh, from start to finish, absolutely everything is in there. It's a one-time purchase and then uh, free uh, content is added over time, free of charge for existing users. Um, so it is added to over time. So that is me, um, that's some of the resources and then we'll get on to the first unit of this mini course. So if you're brand new to cryptocurrency and trading, you might think, well, what exactly am I trading right here? So I just wanna go over what cryptocurrency is, the types of things that you'll need to know from a very basics level on uh, cryptocurrency before you kind of uh, start to get in trading. So for me, there's, there's really two main areas that, that you can trade and there are way more specifics in this, but just to keep it very simple for day trading, everything in this course specifically for day trading, there's really two things you, can, you, you might wanna trade. One is base layer coins and one is DAP coins. I'm just gonna show you the difference between them here, right? So. A base layer coin is a cryptocurrency blockchain coin. The, the base layer, these are usually much bigger than application tokens. So think of the base layer coin uh, kind of like iOS or Android, right? It's the operating system and then you have applications on top. Obviously the operating system is a much bigger, um, you know, more well-used operating system, right? So it's much larger and it has a, a bigger value than a specific application, which is much smaller. So what I wanna get onto really is base layer versus app. Now you can choose to trade any of the tokens, of course, most tr uh, day traders will choose kind of um, bigger tokens. And there's a few reasons for that, which I'll get onto uh, in a second. So base layer coins like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Cardano, XRP, Polkadot, Terra, these are all big, big uh, base layer coins. And of course, they're in the top 10 because they're much larger. When you come down, um, then we're looking at application tokens. Aave is a lending protocol. PancakeSwap is a DEX. Um, Dollar is gaming. You know, Engine Coin is gaming as well, right? So they have a much smaller market. Why is this relevant? Well, really it's relevant because um, base layer coins are much larger and so they reflect a little bit more um, the economy and um, kind of the way risk asset prices are going in general. So that's why day traders usually trade larger coins is because really the large coins will have an effect on the smaller coins. Um, so they usually just trade larger coins because there's more liquidity, they're larger, you know, more traders in and so they more accurately reflect um, kind of fair value as it's known, right? Fair, FV, fair value. Most people will trade bigger coins, they're more liquid, they have better support and exchanges and everything like that. For DAP coins or tokens, you can also trade these, but just know that these are gonna be influenced a little bit more by the uh, specific application news and events. Um, so you can definitely uh, trade these. I would say trading application tokens is maybe for a little bit a longer, a longer time period because really you're trading these around news and events of that chain. Rather, uh, that happens for base layer coins as well, but when you're getting into a Bitcoin, really this is a, a kind of trading really the, the market in general and it reflects the market in general. So just a kind of distinction there, there's no right or wrong, you just might wanna choose um, you know, one or the other. Basically each coin or token that you trade has uh, what I would call a different business model. So if we look at the coins, you know, Bitcoin is, you know, obviously um, 
digital golds kind of yeah it's kind of a sad to say that but you, you know what i mean right that kind of big huge monetary network ethereum has a, a different use case it's for kind of web3 applications solana really focuses on high frequency trading high transaction throughput um, you have you know something like Terra, which is really um, a stablecoin ecosystem but it's building out other things so you can see when you're day trading the one thing i would suggest is really that you, you would focus on one coin and become an expert in that one coin only, right? So rather than flip-flopping between 10 or 20 different coins, that is probably not a good idea because you don't know a lot of the information. So I, what I would recommend is, you know, a coin represents the value of the network that it is, and the coin represents ownership of that project most of the time. When you're day trading, not massively important. Really what you're doing is just trading orders, um, trading market movements. But I would suggest um, that you really just trade one coin specifically for day trading. Most people will just use Bitcoin. It's the biggest, most liquid. Um, so yeah, different types of crypto. You know, you do have those base layer coins, like I said, and that tokens really are for decentralized finance and other things. Meme coins, I personally wouldn't trade these. Um, obviously, there's a ton of um, opportunity with a lot of volatility. I believe as of making this video right now, um, that the kind of meme stock and meme craze is dying down a little bit. And so it's going to become much harder um, to trade these. You can do if you want, if you, you kind of know the... Um, you know, the market for that coin, you know, I would always just go and trade Bitcoin because, you know, Bitcoin is a, a much larger asset and you have much more institutional um, inst institutional investors. And so it's much more predictable in the way that it may move. Obviously still unpredictable, right? But meme coins, you know, these are much more volatile, much more risky, volatile. And you have risk of just, you know, kind of them being out of favor. And so you might get stuck in a trade. So um, you also have exchange tokens. I'll show you these. Exchange tokens are tokens of crypto exchanges. Binance Coin is a crypto exchange. Um, so that's a crypto exchange token. You also have FTX, uh, FTT token. Um, so we'll go and find that one. FTT token is um, FTX's uh, token, so you can see their FT, FTX token, right? So an FTX, like FTX token, that really is going to represent um, the exchange, right? The FTX exchange way more than than like the economy, right? So that's why I'm saying choose something that you trade, make sure that it's liquid enough and that you know enough about it, um, and and then trade that. So you know, FTX is going to be way more specific to the exchange itself, whereas Bitcoin is much larger um, and it's going to be much more about the economy. Now, what one thing I really want to get into is the market cap. And this is something that beginners um, often have some trouble with. And it is the most important thing to kind of know when you're thinking about trading. So, you know, what is a market cap? Market A market cap is when um, you take the total value of a project, that is the market capitalization. That, that's literally it, right? So it's just the total value of what investors think uh, that asset is. So Apple just recently crossed $3 trillion in valuation. That means its market capitalization, its market cap is $3 trillion. Um, so that's just the value of its business. Well, investors um, have valued its business now at $3 trillion, $3 trillion which is crazy. So if you come over to something like CoinGecko, um, you know, a lot of people use this site. You can also use CoinMarketCap as well. Um, but CoinGecko, I think, uh, is just one that I gravitate to. You will see on the right-hand side, market cap. When you look at cryptocurrencies, they will be listed by their market cap, right? So by their valuation. That is the most important thing, is the valuation, the total value of each of these uh, cryptocurrencies and, and what they represent, which is the value of its blockchain and services. This is the real valuation of uh, Bitcoin, currently trading at just under a trillion dollars. Um, and then you have Ethereum, that's number two, that's trading at you know, 400 billion, down to Binance Coin, that's uh, 80 billion. So that is the value that the investors are giving these, um, these projects. Now, really importantly is that uh, what you do is obviously you have fractional ownership of the businesses, right? So it's just like stocks where, you know, Apple doesn't, a Apple has shares, right? And the amount of shares it has doesn't actually matter, right? So you can buy one share, you can buy 10 shares. Um, the price of them 
doesn't matter too much, right? Because its value is three trillion, and if it had one share, um, then that one share would be worth three trillion dollars. If you you know multiply the shares by 10, 100, if you have billions of shares, then each share is going to be worth less, but it's obviously a relatively smaller part of that three trillion valuation. That's exactly the same for cryptocurrencies. So when you have a market cap of 830 billion um, and you have a price of 43,800, you can very easily do the maths here and work out that um, 43,800 goes into 800 billion, roughly about 18 or 19 million times. If we click on Bitcoin right here, you can come down and see the circulating supply is 18.9 million, right? So if you do a calculation, and uh, what, what we can do, I'll just do that very simply for you. So we know we can see the circulating supply right here is 18.9 million coins. Um, so just go back to yeah, the, the slide, 18.9 million coins. Okay, and you times that by the price, which we know is 43,800. Or is it 43,860? You know, when, um, when you multiply that by the price, you'll come out with what should be the actual total valuation, which, uh, which is you know, 830 billion as of now. So if I doubled the amount of coins in existence, which Bitcoin can't do, but if I doubled the amount of coins, then obviously what will happen to the price is that it will halve. The price will halve if you double the amount of coins, but that doesn't matter because the total valuation is the same. If you, if you uh, double the amount of coins, each coin is worth a half, but there are twice as many coins. So the total valuation is the same. The total valuation is the thing that we're trading and not the coin price. So if you go back um, and you can see Bitcoin is worth 43, Ethereum is worth 3,300, it doesn't mean that Ethereum is a tenth of the price of Bitcoin, more or less, right? So there are just more, there are just more Ethereum coins out there. For Cardano, you're saying, wow, $1.29, well, that, if it gets up to like Binance coin at 400, right, that, that's a huge move. But if you look at the market cap, it's already worth 40 billion. So there's obviously, there's obviously more coins for this blockchain, the Cardano blockchain, than there are, you know, let's say somewhere else, right? So, um, you know, Binance coin is worth twice as much as Cardano, but the coin price is you know, 20x or something like that, right? So there's obviously far fewer BNB coins out there than Cardano. I hope that explains it. It's really the market cap that's important, the value of the project. The amount of coins can change. You know, you can have more or less coins, and so each coin may be worth more or less. It doesn't matter. You just buy more or less of those coins. You have a percentage ownership of the capital, the market cap of that coin, and that's the important thing. As of as of making this video, mega caps are like basically Bitcoin and Ethereum above 500 billion valuation. Then I'd say large caps are the top 10 cryptos. Um, if we see them here, they're all valued kind of 20 billion plus. Um, then we can have the mid caps down there, which is kind of the, the 10 to 25. Um, you can see they're valued, you know, I would say uh, above kind of 10 billion or, you know, 7 billion like this. And then as you come down, obviously the smaller ones. Yeah. So what would you, what, what would I day trade? I would always day trade the largest coins, Bitcoin and Ethereum. They have the most traders. They most accurately reflect fair value in the market. Lots of people in them um, and they have the most liquidity. So hopefully that explains kind of the basics of which coin to trade and also the value of each coin. It doesn't matter about what the coin price is, it matters what the market cap is because you can trade fractions of a coin. So everything's done in dollar terms. You can buy 20 bucks of this, 50 bucks of that. Um, and the amount of coins is pretty much irrelevant because everything is traded and valued in dollars uh, versus the coin anyway. When it comes to day trading specifically, we need the right trading platforms. You can't do this on a Coinbase app. They just don't have the right tools. You absolutely cannot do it on that app. Um, you need professional tools, you need advanced trading screens, um, and also you need low fees. So I'm gonna go through really the three main uh, platforms that I use um, and why you might wanna check one of them out over the other. So the first thing we need when day trading for sure is really low fees. If you're paying 3% uh, on Coinbase, on the Coinbase app to trade. That is outrageous. You, you just simply can't day trade like that, okay? So nothing against Coinbase, they're a great app. And for most people that are just buying some crypto to hot, you know, hodl for like 10 years, um, great. I still wouldn't pay 3% personally. 
And you can use Coinbase Pro, which charges you half a percent, um, which is much better, but they still don't have the professional day trading uh, tools that you need. Um, so, you, you know, for me, you know, it just, do, I just can't use that platform because it doesn't give me what I need to trade and, and really um, trade the market. So the first platform that I use a lot is Binance. Their trading speed, their trading fees are 0.075% in the spot market. Uh, the spot market is the cash settled market. This is where you take money like US dollars. Um, you convert it into a crypto like USDT. USDT is a stable coin. Uh, you also have USDC and you have UST and you have BUSD, that's Binance's uh, stable coin. All of these have a value of $1. They are cryptocurrencies though. They track the value of the dollar um, because they have uh, dollars in their account. UST actually doesn't have dollars. It's a decentralized stable coin. We won't get into that, but just know that uh, these are the two most popular, USDT and USDC. Obviously, Binance, US dollars, really popular on, on Binance, uh, the Binance exchange. Um, but essentially, what you do is you take your own fiat currency, like dollars, pounds, whatever it is, um, put it into a stable coin like Binance USD, and then you have basically the value of the dollar to trade um, against uh, you know Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, that would be in the spot market. So you cash settle this. So you need, if you want to buy a thousand dollars of Bitcoin, you need a thousand dollars worth of stable coin to buy, and you own the cryptocurrency, and you can withdraw that cryptocurrency from the platform. So the trading fees in the spot market are about are around 0.075 percent. If you want to day trade, you might use uh, futures. And they're actually a little bit cheaper than this. So many people use futures to day trade um, because they are much lower on the trading fees. And that's really across the board, uh, no matter what platform you're on. Um, so I'll talk about, you know, a little bit more about that in the future. Um, if you're an absolute beginner, I would suggest just staying in the spot market for now. Uh, futures have some higher risk. Um, and there's some things that you need to know. I'll link some future trading uh, tutorials and video guides in the description that go really step-by-step step what futures are, why to use them and everything like that. Um, but yeah, Binance 0.075% is very, very low. Um, they use something called trading view. So you can see the screen right here, down in the bottom left right here, you can see this is um, chart by trading view. So this is really like the gold standard of uh, retail trading um, platforms. They will use trading view as a charting software. It's got absolutely everything you would need. All of the, um, you know, different um, indicators and everything like that, it's all here. So they use that. Um, Fiat on and off ramps are not great anymore. They used to have very good fiat on and off ramps. You could put uh, any uh, fiat currency on yourself. Absolutely, you know, great. Now it's a little bit more difficult. You can still do it, but you have to jump through some other hoops. Um, this is just what crypto is right now. This will change when everything's regulated. So just to keep that in mind, um, they have amazing liquidity. The security is very good and they are trusted. You know, I use them and, you know, never had an issue with them. Um, you know, they're just, they are the biggest crypto exchange in the world for, for a reason. The, the futures trading platform, like I said, is great industry standard type of trading platform. Moving on to KuCoin. Uh, KuCoin is also a platform that I use. A lot of people use KuCoin um, as kind of an alternative exchange, or actually they're just moving on to KuCoin now, really. Um, one of the reasons is that they, for the time being anyway, don't require KYC information to trade. If you want to trade futures and leverage, you do need KYC. And if you want to uh, put fiat currency directly on the platform, they also require KYC. But they are, you know, really amongst the best, most used uh, crypto exchanges in the world, really. They really are on a par with uh, Binance, to be honest, in terms of the, the whole system that they give you. Their trading fees are 08 um, but you can reduce these if you pay your fees in their token, which is called KCS token. So just, you know, get a few bucks of K KCS token on there. You can reduce your fees down to, I think, 0.07. And if your trading volumes go up, they will reduce it further. They also use TradingView. It's exactly the same as Binance. You can see that down in the left. It's literally exactly the same. Um, the, the liquidity is very good. Fear on and off ramps. Yeah, sorry, not, not great as well. Um, you can put money on with a card, but uh, bank deposits are sketchy. You know, they have a, a decent service for some currencies and not for others. So you'll have to, you know, go, um, all the links to these are down in the description. So, you know, go and have a look, um, see which one you want. 
Um, yeah, very good in terms of like liquidity, security. You know, I've used them a lot and ha not, not had any issues. Um, and their futures trading platform is the same as uh, Binance's. Moving on to Bybit, it's another one that's very heavily used, especially for futures trading. Um, you know, a lot of people use Bybit for futures trading, mainly because they give you a deposit bonus when you sign up, which the other two don't. Um, so I'll leave that link in the description as well, but you can get, I think, up to 4,100 4, as a deposit bonus. So if you deposit cryptocurrency onto the platform from another exchange, or um, if you just make a deposit, they will kind of give you like a percent of... Um, how much you deposit as a bonus in your futures trading account. So this is something uh, that I think is a great a great deal for a lot of people just to put crypto on the platform and basically get um, you know a, a free trade out of it because you've basically got you know money in your account as a deposit bonus. You can see that their spot trading fee is actually free. Um, so if you trade spot on the platform, they for the time being I believe. Um, don't charge. I think that's an introductory offer. So check when you are um, watching this. They may have upped and, and charging fees now. But the uh, yeah, the, the trading fees are super low overall. Um, so yeah, in terms of charting, you can see down here, trading view again, right? So it's just industry standard. Everyone uses it. You can see again, it looks very much similar to the other two. Um, and it, you know, the, the platform is, is basically the same, you know, not great fit on and off ramps. It is a card or, um, you know, third parties that you have to go through pretty much the same for all of these platforms. Great liquidity. I've never had any issues with them and the future trading platform is one of the most used. Um, so if you want to check out, you know, the either of these or any of these or get a deposit bonus the links are in the description for you to go ahead um, and basically get set up on those systems now so that you can you know follow me through this trading course calculating your p l or your profit and loss is absolutely vital you can do this before you trade whilst you're trading and then you can make decisions on if it's the right time to get out depending on how much risk you want to be taking um, if you think that the trade has worked out and you're ready to kind of get out of the trade and take your profit or your loss um, then this is very important. So this is a long example. What I mean by long example is if you buy and go long. So that means you're hoping for the price to go up. So you buy at a certain price and sell at a higher price. So this is how we work out um, your P&L, as it's called. Um, so what we do is we take the, the headline price of the asset that we're trading um, to, to work out how much we're, we're making. And obviously the size of your trade is important as well. So as an example, um, and we can go over to buy a bit right now and see that, um, you know, Bitcoin is trading around 43,000, right? So I'll, I'll tell you kind of uh, how to navigate all of this, but before we do that, 43,681. So we'll just make it 40,000, um, you know, and, and do an example here. So let's say you buy 0.5 Bitcoin at 40,000. What does that mean? So what we mean by this is we always quote the um, the price in one unit of that asset. So Bitcoin for one entire Bitcoin costs in the real world right now 43,600. When we quote the price, we always quote, quote the price of one whole unit of that item and then we quote the volume as well. So this is how you work it out. So you can see I'm trading half a Bitcoin at 40,000, right? And let's say I buy. So I buy 0.5 BTC at 40,000 per BTC. And then I sell half a BTC at 42,000. So what I need to do obviously is now work out how much I've actually spent, right? So 0.5 times 40 is obviously 20. Half of 40 is 20. And then half of 42 um, is 20,500 and you can see my p l is 500, my profit and loss. So that's really how you work it out is you say, what is the price per unit? What is the price per unit, right, of the thing I'm trading? And then times that by how much you're actually trading. Um, and then obviously you just do the calculation and that is your profit or loss. So that's for a long example. This is for a short example. When you go short, what you're doing is selling first. So you want the price to come down to make a profit. You sell first and then buy back later. You can only short sell with futures. It's one of the um, kind of benefits or use cases of, of trading futures is that 
you can short sell, meaning you can actually take a bet on the price going down without having any you know, uh, assets to begin with. So let's say you want, you, you think the price of Bitcoin is gonna come down, you can short sell on a futures contract and say, I'm going to sell here and buy back later. Just to show you on Bybit what that looks like, um, you can see right here, um, let me zoom in, open short. That means you can actually, without having any Bitcoin on account, sell Bitcoin. You're not actually selling Bitcoin, you're selling the futures contract. A futures contract is basically a synthetic agreement and it's, it basically lets you bet on the price going up or down. So you don't actually trade the actual underlying asset at all. You just bet on the price going up and down so you can short in the futures market. But let's say this example, we sell the same amount. So we first sell half a Bitcoin at 40,000 and then later on, we buy the same amount of Bitcoin back at a lower price. So you can see we first sell at 40, and then we buy back at 39. So it's the reverse of buying low and selling high. You sell high first and buy back lower. So obviously half of 40,000 and half of 39, you can see 20,000 entry, 19 and a half, you make 500. So exactly the same, right? So if you go long or short, um, you, you just work out your profit and loss accordingly. Um, the other way to do things is working out the percentage return of the unit price and this is a much better way of doing things because we working in percentages um, lets us compare and contrast and everything like that it's obviously a lot a lot easier so the way that we do this um, is essentially divide your profit and loss by your entry price so what you have to do here is let's say we go long so you just work out a percentage of the price difference right so you buy some bitcoin at forty thousand. Um, and it doesn't matter how much, right? You don't put the amount in. Let's say your opening price is 40,000. You could, you could have bought a quarter or a half, or whatever, it doesn't matter. The opening price of your trade is 40 and the closing price of your trade is 42. You know you're long, so you know you're in profit. You take the 2,000, which is your profit, you divide it by your entry price, which is 40K. And then obviously you make it, that, that will give you a decimal 0.05 and then you times it by 100 to get 5% and that's it. So you can say I made 5% on the trade. Why this is better is because you, you take the volume out of it and you're just working in percentages. Percentages is the only way to look at the market, right? So you can work out if I'm in at 40, you know, I want to make 5%. Um, I know exactly what that is, right? So you can just work that out as a percentage. Also, you can trade off of um, the unit price as well, right? So you don't have to keep working out, well, if I make, you know, half of a Bitcoin, that's 20,000 or whatever. So you just work off the percentage. This is really the way to work out your PL. So you say, I made 5% off that trade, or I've got 2% as a risk, a potential 7% trade, and then you can work out your running PL of all your trades as well. So the, the percentage way really is the best way to do it. This is how you do it. You take the entry um, and your close you know, divide the difference um, by your entry. So whatever the difference is, that, that's difference, divide that by your entry times 100 to get the percentage. So that is calculating your PL. When we trade cryptocurrencies, we'll be trading them in a pair. What I mean by that is you obviously have one that you buy and that means there's another currency that you have to sell. Um, that's the only way trading works, right? So I'm gonna talk about currency pairs and the base price and the quote price and what this all means. So um, like I mentioned in the uh, earlier part of the course, most uh, cryptocurrencies are traded against stable coins. And stable coins are designed really um, to you know, provide liquidity in the market, right? So when people trade a risk asset, what they really want to do is trade that against um, a, a non-risk asset like US dollars. US dollar really is the kind of you know reserve currency of the world, um, and so it's very predictable. And so people go into dollars most of the time. So if you're buying from dollars or selling to dollars, you can't use actual dollars. And so stable coins really um, are the you know the use for this. So a stable coin, like I said, one stable coin will be a dollar. You can see this is USDC. And so um, if you want to buy Bitcoin, you have to sell another currency. Most people will convert their dollars into USDC or USDT, Binance USD. There's, you know, there's a lot of stable coins out there. Um, so yeah, you must sell one to buy another. 
And each currency, of course, has an exchange rate, just like if you go on holiday and you, you have your currency and you sell it for another and they give you a certain amount back. It's exactly the same with cryptocurrencies, same with stocks as well, right? So when you say a stock, it's like, oh, Apple's worth $100. What you mean is to, to get one share of Apple computer, you need to give $100 in. So the exchange rate is 100, right? One for 100. Um, so let's look at this. Firstly, we have the base currency and then we have the quote currency. So you have the base and then the quote. Base is on the left-hand side. That is usually the one you want to buy. And then the quote on the right-hand side is the amount that you have to spend to buy one unit of the base. So I'll, I'll go through this uh, on the trading screen. So the base currency, that's one unit of that, whatever it is, right? Could be Apple stock, could be Bitcoin, BTC. That's on the left-hand side, and that is one unit of that. Then on the right-hand side, how much of this one do you need to spend to get the one on the left? Um, so yeah, let's see how that, that looks in the real world. Um, we can see uh, on Bybit, up in the top left, this is the quote, the currency quote, BTC, USDC. They don't, they don't have a slash in the middle. Um, you don't need that. But you can see that is the currency quote. So on the left, I know that the, the base currency is Bitcoin. That's one unit of Bitcoin. On the right, how many USDT, US dollars, does it take to buy one unit of Bitcoin? It tells me here, $43,646.50 to buy one unit. So when you look at other platforms, uh, when you look at, yeah, something like um, CoinGecko, you can see the price of all these, they're valued in dollars, right? So these are all the base currencies and the quote currency is the dollar. Now you can quote a currency, not just in dollars, but you can quote in anything, right? So most of the time you'll see this, BTC USDT, ETH USDT. How much USDT did it take to buy Bitcoin? How much USD does it take to buy ETH. You can also just have a, a direct cross trade between two cryptos, Bitcoin, ETH. So what we're saying here is exactly the same thing. How much ETH does it take to buy one unit of Bitcoin? Come on to Binance. Uh, you can see that here. I've got wrapped Bitcoin. Don't worry about wrapped, so it doesn't matter. So we, we this is the value of Bitcoin against ETH. And you can see that um, the quote is 13.08 what it tells what that's telling me is that it takes 13.08 eth to buy one unit of bitcoin that kind of works out right because you can see the difference in price um you know 3000 here 43000 so that works out it also gives me the quote in dollars to buy bitcoin down here as you can see so yeah when it comes to um when it comes to the, the, the quote and base currency, that is you know as, as simple as it gets. You know How much of this one does it take to buy the one on the left-hand side? The one thing you'll need to master to day trade for sure is the order book. The order book is uh, present with more advanced trading systems and it lets you have full control over what you're trading. You absolutely need to use the order book when day trading. Um, it's not good to just kind of use the kind of uh, Coinbase style, you know, buy, it's just not gonna work. So the order book is a professional um, um, utility that, that pros will use. So this is an order book and in the real world, it looks like this. Um, so you can see that right here. And it actually says at the top, order book. Um, and it is literally just a book of orders. It's a collection of orders. And this is really important because you, you can see where the orders are, the price, the volume, the size, as we call it, everything else. So just to show you in the real world, we have a, the mid price here. This is the actual price of Bitcoin. Everything above that, they're, they're sellers saying, I wanna sell some Bitcoin higher. And everything below that, these are buyers saying, I want to buy Bitcoin cheaper. Obviously, the, the lowest offer and the highest bid will match up. That's called the mid price or you know the, the market price. This is the actual price of Bitcoin in the market right now, based on what you can see down here, recent trades. So recent trades going through and you will see that every time this changes, so do the recent trades and vice versa, right? So they are absolutely linked one for one. So what does this actually mean? Well. The order book is a collection of orders, right? So everyone up here is a seller and everyone down here is a buyer. Why that's important is because 
what you'll see is essentially the price moves around a lot, right? You can see it ticking up and down and moving around. Well, what you can do as a professional trader is say, instead of just taking any price, right? So I'm just gonna take a price and say, hey, like whatever. I can actually say, you know what? I'm gonna bid down here at this lower price. If the, if the price ticks around, I'm getting a better price down here. So you can input orders that you're unable to execute at the immediate moment, but that obviously gives us much more control about the prices that we're paying. And that's obviously what professionals will do is they say, if I'm a buyer, I'm gonna place some bids down here and see if the market moves around. The market moves around daily, right? And every second of the day, it moves around. If I go to the one minute chart right here, what you'll see is that the market definitely moves around. And so if you're a buyer, you're saying, well, I'm not just gonna buy up here. I'm gonna put some uh, bids around this level, around 43.6, 43.64, which is actually below the current price. And I may get some, you know, filled with some bids. So that is why an order book is very, very important is because you have sellers at the top and buyers at the bottom. In the middle, this is the actual price, but you have full control if you want to offer some BTC up here or bid for some BTC down here. Um, so the spread, this is a, like an important kind of thing to know, what, what is the spread? The spread is the difference uh, between the highest bid and the lowest offer. This is the lowest offer, offer is a seller. In, in the States, um, you'll know this is a, a, the ask. Um, so you'll say, oh, they're on the ask, it means they're selling. Uh, in the UK, we say offer. Um, this is the highest bid. This is the highest buyer, right? So they obviously match up. The spread between them, the difference between them is known as the spread. When you trade smaller cryptos, the spread will be higher for various reasons. The liquidity is lower and um, there just isn't, there aren't enough market participants to make the spread very tight. When you trade Bitcoin, you have algo, you know, algo traders, computers doing things, and so the spread is very, very tight. The spread is a cost. The spread is a trading cost. When you buy something on the offer, you are immediately in a loss because if you sell it straight away, you have to sell it at a cheaper price. So it's a cost of trading. It doesn't make much difference. Most cryptocurrencies that you're gonna trade are extremely liquid, so don't worry about this but it is something to watch out for. If the spread is very high, you know, you're gonna be constantly churning that spread. The way you make money is obviously by buying low and selling high, but if, you, if you're already kind of down 1% because the spread is really high, you have to make that 1% up before you even start getting into break even, right? So luckily, if you're trading Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, any of the top 10, this spread, as you can see, is super tight. I mean, it's like not even worth worrying about. You can see that the spread here is uh, 65, five to 66, right? So it's a tiny spread, but definitely something to watch out for. What's more important trading crypto is something called maker taker. Most trading platforms will um, uh, charge you fees based on what's called maker taker fees. Um, let me explain what maker taker is, maker taker. We've seen in, in the previous slides, what um, you know the, the buyers and sellers are. You can, uh, you can, bid, for, you can bid for crypto or you, know, you can offer crypto. So, um, a, a, make, a maker taker, a maker of liquidity is someone that uh, is either a buyer or a seller, but you show your order on the book at either a high or low price. So let me explain. Let's say you're a buyer. What you want to do is put a bid in for crypto, for Bitcoin, right? You don't want to buy it straight away, okay? So you do not take any of these prices, okay? This is a big no-no. You do not take these prices. This is liquidity on the book. This is other people saying, I'm a seller at this price. Don't take their orders. But what you do is you make liquidity. You make liquidity by putting a bid in the book at a lower price. That's known as being a maker of liquidity. You're showing your order to the market and you're putting liquidity onto the order book, but not trading straight away. When you're a taker, what you do, if you're a buyer, is you say, I'm just going to take the best offer, which is 58548 right here, right? So you take their liquidity off the book because they have liquidity on the book, you take it away to buy um, and then that's it, right? So you close their, their offer basically. Um, the reason why this is important is because makers 
um, actually have most of the time lower fees on crypto trading platforms. You might get um, you know, a little discount on your trading fees. Takers will usually pay higher trading fees. It's very, very minimal. And so for most people, it's not going to make a difference. But something I just thought I'd highlight, if you're a maker of liquidity, so if you're a buyer, you actually bid at a lower price. If you're a seller, you offer a little bit of a higher price. Um, you might get cheaper trading fees. When you day trade and trade professionally, there are a few different order types that you'll be using to give you full control over all of your trading. Uh, I'll go through them now very quickly. So um, there are kind of three different types that I want to explain in this video, which is a market order, limit order, and a stop order. Um, these will cover pretty much 99% of, of what you, you'll be doing. Um, and they have different um, pros and cons, right? So each order type is just used for a, for a different use case, and it can control the three main things that you need to control when you trade. The first one is the price that you trade at. So using order types, you can make sure you know exactly the price that you're trading at um, with stop and limit, not market. I'll go over that in a second. Volume, so you need to control the volume that you trade at, right? So how, how much are you trading? That is super important to, um, to control. And then also you can control the time. How long do you want the order to be in the system? Do you want the order to cancel at some, some time? Or do you want the order to either go through or be canceled dependent on other conditions like the price and the volume of, um, that is available to trade, right? So you absolutely need an advanced trading screen for this. Bybit, Binance, KuCoin, like I showed you, uh, links in the description if you haven't, you know, not following already. Um, so yeah, let's, let's go through that. So the first one is a market order. Um, a market order is when you do not choose the price that you, you trade at. So if you're a buyer, you will just lift this one right here. The best offer, you will uh, just lift that. If you say, yep, hit the buy button right now, you will be paying this price, whatever the lowest offer is. You will be paying higher uh, taker fees for doing so. You control the volume that you trade. You can control how much you buy, but you cannot choose um, the price that you trade at. Let me show you this. On the right hand side on Bybit, um, we can see market market order. See how you can choose the price. You can choose the quantity, one Bitcoin, 90 Bitcoin, 0.07 Bitcoin, right? So you can, you can uh, choose the amount that you trade, but there's nothing down here that lets you choose the price that you trade at. So why trade like this? It's fast, it's convenient, and it gets the order done. And sometimes that is what you need to do, right? If you're like, hey, look, I just want to sell out. You, 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 just want, you just want to hit market order, put the amount in that you sell, trade out of it. So there are some downsides, but there are some upsides too. The next one is a limit order. I would suggest most of the time using limit orders um, because like I said, you can actually say, hey, you know what? I'm a buyer, but I'm going to kind of place my order somewhere down here. And I hope that the market chops around and eventually comes down to my price. The benefit is that you choose the price that you pay. You can choose the volume that you you um, you trade at, um, and also you get uh, sorry maker fees, right? Which are a little bit cheaper, you know, most of the time. Not a massive difference though, but you know, uh, it is a difference. So I'm going to show you that on on Bybit. Come over to limit order. Now we can we can put the order price in, right? So you see that here. So now I can say, okay, you know what? The market is currently 43.7. I want to bid 43.701. Just you can click on this on most systems, right? So you can click this right here. 43.701 populated. Now I can choose the amount that I uh, you know that I'm buying, and it's all there. Now what will happen here is that this order will obviously not trade straight away because the market price is 704 and you're bidding 701. So what's going to happen? is that you, you will come down here to the left hand side and you can see um, active, active orders. That will be um, an active order or I believe it will be um, probably in positions actually. Um, either one, it, you, you'll see it come up here um, and it will show you that you've got an order in the system to buy a certain amount of the crypto and the price that you want to pay. Um, that will have not traded for you until the market obviously comes down to that price. And what will happen is essentially it will say, okay, you've traded now, you've got this open position. Or if the price keeps moving up, 
you won't get any, you won't have bought any. And so one of the downsides of limit orders is that, you know, you might put a limit order in and the market might move away from you and then you haven't got the trade and then you're kind of chasing the trade. So pros and cons with everything. Um, but with a limit order, um, absolutely, um, you know, there's a lot of benefits here. Something else you can do with a limit order is you can see good till cancelled. So obviously uh, self-explanatory, I think good, it's good. The order is good until you cancel it. Um, so that's just left in there until you physically cancel it. Immediate or cancel, that is, if you can't trade this right now, then cancel my order. Um, so that will do that for you. So, and fill or kill, fill or kill is um, based on volume. So you, you can just see that, right? So fill or kill is um, fill my order completely or kill the whole order. So that's based on volume, not price. Um, so let's say you put an order in at 41 or 43,701 to buy uh, 20 Bitcoin, right? But you can only fill half a Bitcoin, it's going to kill the whole thing. So either do it all with my volume or don't do any of it. So yeah, it's just, just some things to kind of think about when putting in um, limit orders. So a lot more control, a couple of downsides as well. The next one is a stop order. Stop orders are called take profits or stop loss orders. So I'm going to, um, you know, kind of uh, go through a stop, a stop loss order here. So a stop order um, is an instruction to the trading system to trade based on certain parameters. The stop order is a very simple if, then. So it's a very simple if then instruction. If a price is hit, then buy or sell, or do something. So you, you instruct the system very specifically to do something. This is very different to a limit order in that when you place a limit order, you are placing a trade uh, on the system um, to go through. So what you're saying is, I want to buy, let's say we're going long here, I want to buy one BTC at 43,701, and that is in the system, my order has been placed. A stop order is different. A stop order, and it's called conditional order on Bybit, um, but it may be called stop order somewhere else. You know, they'll all be here. It only triggers the actual order itself when a condition is met. That's why it's called condition on, on Bybit. And you have a trigger price. So what I can say here is when, uh, when the price of Bitcoin hits 40,000 and it's currently at 43, I actually want you to sell my Bitcoin, one Bitcoin at uh, 40,000 with a market order. See how you have much more control here? So the conditional order says, if the price gets to this level, then do what I want. Either sell with a market, sell with a limit, or buy with a market, buy with a limit. Why is this important and why would you want to do that? It's very different to a limit order. If I put a limit order in right now to, into the system and say, I want to sell Bitcoin at 40,000, it is going to actually sell that for me straight away right now because the price is 43.7. And so the system's like, hey, you told me to sell Bitcoin right now with a limit, a lower limit of 40,000. It's 43.7. I'm getting you a great deal. I'm going to sell all your Bitcoin. A conditional order is different where it says only if the price gets to 40,000, then sell my Bitcoin. Why is that important? This is known as a stop loss. This is when you can say, if I go long and I've got Bitcoin at 43 and the price drops to 40, I've made a loss, I've been wrong, I'm going to cut my losses and move out of the trade, take a loss and move on. You can only do that with a conditional order because a limit will sell your Bitcoin straight away. But with a conditional or a stop loss order, you can say that's my stop loss only when the price gets here, then sell out my Bitcoin. So a stop loss is really uh, important. If then is known as stop loss order. You can also do it on the upside um, and say, hey, if the price moves up, then actually buy me more. You can use that to break out, right? So instead of saying, I want to buy at 43, you can say, I actually want to buy at 45 when we're breaking out of a resistance level and actually get into that trade. That's for, you know, some different techniques. Um, but yeah, hopefully that explains the difference between market limit and stop orders. They all have very specific uses and can be used uh, when trading.
There's two ways to analyze a cryptocurrency. The first is through fundamental analysis and the second way is through technical analysis. They're the kind of two broad areas that you, you might want to use to kind of um, shape your trading. When day trading, which this kind of video is about, is um, really we're looking at, at technical analysis mostly, but also there's a lot of fundamentals in there as well, like macro trends, what the market is doing in general. So I think both can help you here. Um, so we're gonna go over the difference between fundamentals, technicals, and where I see this. Um, just to kind of um, obviously supplement this as well, I can't really go too much into the fundamentals here. Obviously, you know, I'm just gonna have a brief overview. What I would suggest if you're looking at um, kind of how I would, um, you know, how I trade cryptocurrency and invest in cryptocurrency, my crypto course basically goes way more in depth into all of this. So I've got about 100 plus videos already, um, adding new content all the time. If you're a beginner in crypto, you want to know how to trade, how to invest, um, how to think about investing, all of the professional stuff that I had to go through years of experience for, all of that is shared in this course. So you can see I talk about cryptos, um, how to state cryptocurrency, how to analyze um, coins, tokenomics, right, which is all the um, different, you know, parts of uh, the token and all the economics around a token, how to use on-chain analysis, how to do your own research, a huge section on trading, um, which is basically like this video, you know, on steroids, how to use wallets and, you know, DeFi, right, to earn yield on your, your, uh, your, uh, your coins and everything like that. And then some investing techniques that I learned and, you know, had to spend years kind of going through, um, you know, all, all of the exams, right, to, to go through all of that. So that is all shared in this course. It's a one-time fee. And then um, content is updated, uh, updated over time, free of charge for existing users. Uh, the price does go up over time as that new content is added though. Um, also, we have Discord groups as well. You know, loads of people are just chatting in those groups, um, sharing ideas and, and, you know, asking questions. I'm in those groups. My portfolio and my trades are all in that group as well. So, you know, if you do want to check out the course, I'll leave that linked in the description to go way more in depth into you know some of the analysis that I do over the long term. Something I want to talk about though really is the difference between fundamentals and technicals, right? So fundamentals are really all of the stuff that will uh, drive the growth and the valuation of an asset over time. So for stocks, you know, let's take Apple. The fundamental analysis is how many iPhones are you selling? How, you know, how big is your services revenue in relation to previous times? How is the market? Is it growing? Hey, Tesla, how is the EV market growing? How, uh, how many cars are you selling? What's your profit per car? All of that is fundamental stuff. When it comes to uh, cryptos and blockchains, what we're really looking at most of the time is the adoption curve, right? So, you know, how many people are using the platform? Um, how many wallets are being created? How many people are coming into the, the blockchain itself? Actually, you can do this fundamental, fundamental analysis right here. Bitcoin rainbow price chart. So what is this? This is the price chart of Bitcoin. Um, and then it gives you kind of a, you know, a range of prices um, over time, right? And this is fantastic to, to kind of show you where we are, where we are in each of the cycles. So this is just one thing you can use is obviously wallets, you know, the amount of users per blockchain and everything like that, which is, um, I think very important because it can really shape your day trading as well. Um, so I don't think um, you, you can only focus on one. It's really a lifelong um, amount of time that you have to kind of put towards trading, knowing all of this stuff. DAP usage, fees paid on the blockchain or the application, if you're day trading applications, what are the fees paid? Price to earnings ratio. Uh, so I won't go through that in this, this video, but essentially it's um, what is the price of the asset versus its earnings? So you, you can work that out, right? Especially for applications or decentralized applications, um, you know, their products and their services and they make money. In fact, some applications make a lot of money. And so you can definitely value those applications based on their revenue for sure. Um, so that's something we talk about in the crypto course, just as a brief, brief overview here. It really is the intrinsic value of the asset that you're trading, right? So how much money does it make and how much am I paying for that revenue stream? User adoption, total value locked, the total amount of money locked into the blockchain in the system. Um, this will you know, change the coin price over time, over the long term. More people that use Bitcoin, more people that have wallets, the value of it grows over time because you know humans doing things creates value. Um, valuations on crypto is most, mostly about adoption and growth over time. Here's where TA is different, technical analysis. It really only focuses on the price. 
uh, it focuses on price data and patterns and we're analyzing these things it's important when you trade so I think fundamentals are really important on why to trade. And then TA is that last mile, the last step of, right, I've made, a, I've made a, a decision. I think the market's in a good place or I think the market's in a bad place. I think I'm ready to trade. Now we step in and do our technical analysis on the chart and get our trading levels. It does disregard fundamentals a lot. And this is a big downside for me. The chart can look really good, but if you ignore the fact that, um, you know, Jerome Powell from the Fed is about to have a meeting and come out really hawkish. And so they're going to dump the market. You are you're in a bad position. So it disregards fundamentals and you shouldn't disregard fundamentals. You cannot rely only on TA. TA, though, is appropriate for the short and medium term because it gives us price levels. And without it, we kind of, you know, in the dark, right? We don't know where to put our entry, our stop loss and our take profit. Um, and it relies heavily on, um, yeah, day trading. Day trading relies heavily on um, TA for sure. So uh, what I want to get into is uh, trends. Technical analysis can only show you so much and the real trends in the market, the thing that really moves the market is the, the economic figures. So you have to keep uh, ahead of these as well. So what I would say here is that um, TA can only show you so much. The real market trend is much, much harder to determine because you have many different factors. Economic figures, interest rates, testimony from the Fed, whoever's leading it at the current time, non-farm payrolls, which is employment data out of the States, all of this stuff, the economic figures that come out kind of on a weekly and monthly basis, all of these move the markets over time and the market reacts to them. And what you're doing when you're day trading, really when you're day trading, not investing, but when you're day trading, you are trading the sentiment of traders based off of what's happening here. What do traders think will happen versus what has happened? And that moves markets. When you're day trading, the fundamental value of a project is basically zero um, in your thinking because you're day trading. When you're investing, the fundamental value and growth is the, the biggest thing. When you're day trading, you are trading the sentiment of the market and other traders. And you need to understand this. And so you need to definitely keep up with this you know, keep up with the economy, what's happening, what traders think is happening and the sentiment of the market and the sentiment of how the economy is growing. All of that macro stuff is going to change sentiment. And that is why a lot of people uh, trade Bitcoin, maybe Ethereum is because they're bigger. And so they react more purely to the market movements. When you're trading smaller coins, they will be influenced by these bigger coins. And also they will be influenced by specific things that are happening in those specific coins as well, which you also need to be super aware of, right? So if you're trading something and you think the market's going really well right now, but the altcoin that you're trading has a big bit of news coming up and it's kind of bad news or they fail or something like that, that is going to tank that asset. But with Bitcoin, the reason people trade it is, is because those kind of black swan events really have to be a huge like market wide black swan event rather than a small altcoin, which specifically can be, hey, look, the developers mucked up and there's a hack. So this is kind of um, the things to think about when we're analyzing stocks, fundamental technical analysis and the decisions we make when what assets to trade and then kind of how to trade them over the long term. Candlestick charts are the only way that you can day trade. Using a line chart is just absolutely not gonna work. It's another one of those things that you'll find on Coinbase. You'll see the line chart, completely useless. You have to use candlesticks. Candlesticks are um, just, just the way to trade. They give you so much more information than a line chart. Here's what a line chart does. It says, here was the price, right? And nothing else. Well. I need more information than this. When was the price this level? You know, when in the day? Where did traders take it in the day? What other information have you got for me? There's no information here. What we need is um, a candlestick. Now a candlestick gives us four bits of information. You can see it on the chart here. So this is a candlestick. So come up to your chart and then click candles. You can also choose ho uh, hollow candles, bars. They're actually all the same. They're just a slightly different design, but we're gonna go with candles. You can see right here, each candlestick is one time period. That time period can be any time period that you want. I am on a day chart right here. You can see one day. That means each candlestick is one day in length. I'm gonna switch over to the 15 minute chart. You can see the candles change. Each candlestick is now 15 minutes. 
So that's the first thing. Each candlestick is a period in time. So that's really important when you're trading because you need to know what's happening during that time. So there are really four things you need to know during a trading session or a time period. The first is um, at what price does, the, does Bitcoin um, trade at when this time period begins? That's drawn as a line. During that time period, this is gonna be an hour in time. During that time period, we would assume that the price can go up and down and fluctuate. Of course it can. So a line is drawn at the price levels. So let's say this is a, a chart, right? This is 100, this is 99. Bitcoin opened the session uh, 12 o'clock at 99. So we draw a line here. During the session at like 12.30, um, the low was kind of down here, right? So we're drawing a line and mapping the price. Now at 12.50, some buyers came in and actually pushed the price all the way up to 100. Um, so we draw that line as well, right? And then the price can go up and down, up and down, right? So we just draw that line. Now at one o'clock, because this is an hour candle, what happens is that what's the price of Bitcoin? It just happens to be just under 100. Let's say people pushed it up to like, you know, one point, whatever. So that's the closing price. So what we have is we have an open price, we have a closing price, and we also have a high and a low for that one hour. The closing price is above the open price, and so the price has moved up in the hour, and so we color it in green. What we can see here, exactly the same, um, Let's take this one right here. So you have an open price, which is obviously this one. I know that's the open because the candle is green. So it's telling me that this was the open price. And then the colored, the colored in area is the closing price. That's where it closed. During the time period, you can see the price was actually for, forced right down here where the wick is called a wick. So the lines, we call them wicks, and then the body right here. So the price opened at this, the Bitcoin opened at this price, it fell toward to, to this price during the time session. It went up to this price during the session and came off a little bit and finished a little bit lower for the session. This is so much better than a line chart. A line chart just says, hey, during the day at some random point that I'm not gonna tell you, the price was 45,000. This one says during, during the period of 12 to one, the price opened at 47, dropped to 46 and a half, went up to 48 and then closed at 47.90. I get so much more info. So it's all about candles. Now what happens is that it plots one by one, right? So let's say um, the price of the next candle opens here, it goes up to here, down to here, closes here, and it's red because the open is uh, the, the open is above the close, right? So it closed down and you just keep plotting all the time. Why is this important? You can get patterns and patterns tell you certain things. First one is the hammer pattern. Hammer pattern is called such because it looks a bit like a hammer. This is known as a bullish reversal pattern. What happens is that during the time period, the, um, the obviously we open at this level, right? This is the open, uh, sorry. Yeah, th this is the closing period, right? So we open, open here and we close here. The low is here and the high is here. We're closing near the high, kind of bullish, right? And also what it's telling me is that sellers came in, pushed the price all the way down to here, but buyers came in and forced the price all the way up and actually it finished higher. So what, what that's telling me is that sellers came in but got completely overwhelmed by buyers. What I can think here is that during this time period, if buyers came in and pushed the price up, are they gonna spill over into the next time period? They may well do. Let's try and find a hammer and we can see that here. This is a hammer of sorts, right? Never gonna be perfect in the real world, but you can see uh, we opened here, the price got forced down, buyers came in, pushed the price up, and then they spilled over into the next session and the price went up. So this doesn't work every time. This is cherry picks, of course. You will con consistently see hammers that don't print like that. Like this one, you can see uh, that's kind of a hammer right here and then a big sell-off. So it doesn't work every time. You have to take into account the general market sentiment, the general trend, and also what's happened previously. We got a huge sell-off right here. So what this was basically was a relief rally. Um, you know, just kind of a session where people were like getting their stuff together and the sellers came back in. So 
you have to use um, candlesticks with trends as well. Um, but these are some some classic kind of examples. What's a shooting star? It's basically the complete opposite of um, a hammer. So what happens is you have this. So it looks a little bit like a shooting star, right? So obviously um, the open was here, the close is below. Buyers came in, tried to force the price up, and they just got absolutely walloped and the price finished lower. It's kind of a bearish um, bearish kind of shooting star. You can kind of see it here. It's not a perfect shooting star, but you can see that, right? So you had a huge bullish move. Um, buyers came in, kept on, but during the second half of the session, they just got forced down and, you know, it kind of, it's over. And that's kind of a shooting star, um, kind of a bearish reversal, reversal pattern. So something to, to watch out for. The next one is bullish engulfing. Engulfing because the, the, the present candle completely engulfs the previous candle. That's obviously bullish, right, to the upside. Like if you have a small candle, and the next one's like a big move that engulfs the previous one. This is a bullish reversal pattern. Um, so we can kind of try and see one of these. Uh, so a bullish engulfing, um, kind of, yeah, kind of here. Yeah, this one, this one's kind of a good example, right? So you see a sell-off here, and then what you see is kind of a, a small candle print here that's down. And then the next session, what you get is the, the bullish candle completely engulfs the previous candle. Um, and so you get a, what's called a bullish engulfing. And what that tells a trader is, well, if this candle is so bullish, maybe the tides have turned, maybe buyers are coming in and will push things higher. The whole point of all of this is trying to ride people's, people's orders when you're day trading. So that's a, a bullish engulfing. Um, a bearish engulfing is obviously the complete opposite. So you have you know a small bullish candle or a couple of small bu bullish candles, and then a big bu a bearish engulfing to the downside. And then obviously, um, yeah, th th this is perfect example, right? So you have some small green candles and then whoops, right? So this is obviously like, Oh, well, like what's happened, right? This is obviously bearish and this may continue kind of a little bit of a sell off. Um, and what you do is kind of wait for the next session, maybe put in a, a sell order here to go short, put your stop loss up here, ride it down to the, the next wave down. So um, with, with uh, candlesticks, they're not perfect. They are something that we can use to give us a, a little bit of an edge, but they don't tell us the trend. They don't tell us the trend. Um, they don't tell us how the market's moving. That comes down to fundamentals and, and technical analysis and kind of the wider trend, how the market is. But they are specifically very good for using to enter into a trade and get some confirmation specifically when you enter the trade. So candles are good to, to know. That's the basics. Um, and using them when you enter the trade definitely is recommended. I'm going to quickly touch on chart patterns that you might want to look at as well. So I think these are, are decent to use, but really it is the, the wider market that's going to affect these patterns. But when these patterns play out, um, they give us some levels that you might want to use specifically for day trading. So uh, I'm going to look at that um, right now. I actually go into way more detail in my course um, about trends and you know trading th those types of patterns. You can see all these videos. Um, so I'm going to go kind of over this in as much detail as I can for kind of a, a mini course, right? So the first one is what's known as a double top. I, um, I think trends are good to look at, but they're not the be all and end all. I much prefer looking at the fundamental economy to um, tell me where the real market trend is, but good to know. What is a double top? Very simply is when the market tops out twice. This is bearish because what you get is this kind of move up. Buyers are like, woo, let's push the price up. They get, they get resistance, they get hit by sellers, and you can see this top right here. Then you then move down and then buyers come in and say, no, nope, we're bullish. We're going to push the price up, but they get rejected again by sellers. And then you basically, you, you top twice and then the market's like, we're not, we're not supposed to be up here. They, they run out of steam. Market goes lower. Bitcoin is the uh, longest running double top that I've ever seen in existence. You can see this, this is on the one week chart, right? So each individual candlestick is a week chart. This is, um, almost the perfect double top. So you can see a huge rise up um, and massive kind of uh, resistance at this level around 60,000 get pushed down. Over you know, an, uh, an amount of months, weeks and months pushed up again to this top, again pushed down. That's known as a double top. It's fairly bearish. So when you were around this level um, and the price got rejected, as a day trader, you're thinking, hang on, this is a double top. 
what you what you might want to do is say we've just double topped we're going bearish a little bit we're coming down enter into a short trade here from 57 buy it back at 48 what a great trade now unfortunately it's not that the double top um, absolutely precedes a, a fall it's because of what happened in the market that actually this happened we just see this double top but what happens is um, bas basically self-fulfilling but also you know, at this level, you can use the chart pattern and say, hey, look, we're, we're at the top again. I want to be quite cautious right here because we could have a double top. And this means you're thinking about day trading. Like if we get rejected at this level, then maybe I can start shorting the price. If the market is also saying, hey, you know what? Like, we're, you know, the market's coming off a bit. When you can recognize, hey, I think we've double topped here. It might be a good risk reward trade for you to say, I can short this price with my stop loss around the resistance level so there is no perfect chart or pattern or anything like that when you trade it is all about setting um, your price levels based on what i call areas of value that's why i kind of um, look at these chart patterns chart patterns don't tell you how to trade you have to know how to trade from all of your research but the patterns can help you put in some risk mitigation, some price levels that you can be confident to trade. Um, so that's what I use chart patterns for. A double bottom is the exact opposite, right? So sellers are, are kind of forcing the price down and they meet um, buying pressure, they meet support, and then kind of support, you know, gets a bit, they kind of run out a bit. They try again, right? Sellers try again, or, you know, sellers are pushing the price down again, but they meet support again at this level. This price level right here is obviously super important that it's hit support twice. So now you're saying buyers are at this price, sellers are running out of steam, it might go a bit higher. In terms of a double bottom, uh, we'll come over to the chart and see if we can find one, uh, maybe go to the day. Uh, day chart here. Yeah, you might have to go to the four hour to kind of fi find a double bottom. Um, so, I mean, what you can see, yeah, double bottom on the chart, it doesn't happen that much. Um, so, you know, this, I would say, not really a double bottom, but you can see an area of support right here, right? So sellers come in, hit this bottom, um, move up again, kind of try and sell the price off again, kind of hit this support level, moves up again. They try and hit this support level once more, but obviously this price level is you know kind of important and the price moves up, right? So you've got sellers coming in going, sell, 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 and they just kind of meet a very visible support level right here. So this is where buyers are saying, you can sell me all the Bitcoin you want at this price. Like I'll, I'll just lap it up. And eventually sellers are just running out and the buyers are coming in and it moves up. So not really a double bottom. It's more kind of like a consolidation around there, but double bottoms um, and double tops, you know, the chart the, in real life doesn't trade like this. So these are just, this is theory to, to kind of, um, you know, look at things. A trend is great to see. A trend is just simply, obviously a trend either to upside or downside. The way we really um, look at a trend is something called higher highs uh, or lower lows or higher lows and lower highs. So let me explain that. An uptrend, what you're going to want is higher all the time, of course, right? In an uptrend, everything has to be higher all the time. So a market moves in stages and cycles and waves, not, not a straight line. What you want to see in an uptrend is higher highs and higher lows. So if, if you're seeing higher highs and higher lows, you can be confident that you're in an uptrend overall. I'm gonna to go to maybe the day chart here um, and see if we can kind of get higher highs and higher lows. So you can see really, um, let, let, yeah, I think one, one day is enough, right? Higher highs and higher lows, uh, perfect. Um, so what we can see, if I draw, draw on the chart maybe, can draw like, um, let's reset the chart. Uh, what we can draw is probably some boxes right here just to see these higher highs and higher lows. Um, so yeah, draw that on the chart, right? So you see this high and then a low, and then what you see is a higher high here and a low, but it's a higher low than, than previous, right? And this is a higher high than previous. That's very clearly an uptrend, right? So, you know, you can draw that. That's very clearly an uptrend. And then you actually have a higher high and a higher low and a higher high. And then, and then we break down. But it's very clearly an uptrend, right? It's not just moving up, but when you when you get the sell-offs, which always happen, you get the peaks and the troughs. These are higher highs and higher lows. What you want to be doing in an uptrend is basically buying in during the sell-off and the dip, if you believe you're still in an uptrend, because you're getting cheaper, and then you can ride the price up to the high, 
higher than before, you know, sell some, sell some at any stage, wait for the dip. If you still believe you're in an uptrend, buy the dip, ride it up. The um, You always have to have risk management in place because obviously the the downside, the danger is that you get a higher high and then worse, you get like an actual sell off and a reversal. That's mega, so that's why you always need stop loss in when day trading. A, an uptrend is higher highs and higher lows printed. Exactly the opposite for a downtrend, you get a high, but then the, ne but then the next high is lower than the previous high, right? It's a lower high and a lower low. Not, not good. Um, so we can see that here. Um, perfect downtrend you can see on the chart. So let me draw this in, see if I can change the color a little bit to kind of make it stand out. Right, we have the high, um, then we have kind of a sell-off and the low, and then we have a, a relief rally. This high um, from this kind of sell-off is obviously lower than before. Um, then we have this kind of low, kind of moving down, right? Um, and then we have a, a relief rally. Again, it's kind of lower than the previous one. Uh, then we have another low, right, which is lower than before, so a lower low going down. And then we have the high, again, it is lower than the previous high, so we're still in a downtrend. Now what happens, just like in this uptrend that we saw here, eventually it may reverse. And so what people will trade is they'll trade the low and they'll want to kind of trade that bounce, right? So that's that's what they may trade. So that is how to kind of look at trends um, and try and find them on the chart. The difficult thing is to know the the time scale of the trend, right? Because there's a short-term trend and a long-term trend. What's the longer-term trend versus the short-term trend? So you can make money in either of those, okay? Some people trade super short-term and so can benefit from a, from a sell-off, but actually the long-term is um, an uptrend and some people may be buying um, to, to, to benefit from the longer term uptrend. So it depends on your time scale. Other things we need to look at apart from those trends is something called support and resistance, which is really the, the main thing that you use when uh, trading and um, putting in stop losses, take profits and price levels. Key level of trade is support and resistance. The price is sticky around these areas. I'm gonna show you this on the chart. It absolutely is sticky around these areas. And once you've got a little bit of experience, um, you will be able to see this. Um, it's very, very clear. Um, and it will show you very, very key areas that you can go ahead and trade. Um, so I'm just gonna show you that on the chart. What you, what you can see here is I've drawn in a trend line and I've drawn in uh, boxes, which I call areas of value. So definitely um, highs and lows will be known as support and resistance. Um, so what you can see is we have a low right here and then we have a bounce off of this resistance at the bottom and it moves up. This is, uh, for me, an area of value. So the actual support level was 29,500 where it bounced off, okay? So that would be a, a key kind of uh, place to draw a trend line. Um, so we're gonna do that here. Do red, yeah, that's fine. This would be a, a great area to draw a trend line. Okay, so you have an area of support. Now support to the downside, right? When the price moves down and then bounces off that support. That's a trend line right here. Um, and then what we can do is find other price levels where the price kind of consolidates or meets resistance and support. Why have I got this trend line up here? Because you can see that the chart trades around this level three times and it bounces off this level. You can see the, a move to the upside, it gets rejected. So this is resistance here it's resistance once more here, and it's resistance for a third time, we get rejected, we meet support down here, this is a key level, definitely, so this is support, and I put the trend line in here, we then move up to this resistance level again, and the chart fumbles around here again. That, com that is confirming this price level as a key area. We then move up and get a and get a you know a move to the upside, but when the pullback comes, which it always comes, it comes down, Oh, to this level once more, right? That resistance before has now turned into support. This is obviously an extremely key area of trade, whatever price this is, happens to be 40,000. Humans love to trade around num round numbers. We then get a massive push to the upside, um, huge, you know, huge levels. Now you're thinking, let's draw some new levels on here. You can see this resistance right here and it turns support right here. This is another key level. Just happens to be 53,000 or so, 52,000. So I'd put another uh, line in here, right? So 
Uh, won't do that for now, but we are we trade above it. Then what we do is when we get a sell off, you can see once more the support level comes in at the previous support and the previous resistance. It is uncanny how many times the price trades around areas of support and resistance. Then we then we come down and lo and behold, when the sell off comes and the big sell off, it comes down to this price level once more, which has been resistance three times, support and resistance once each here and support here one, two, three times. Now it's support again, 40,000. So really, you can just see where to where to enter your, your support and resistance levels. Key areas of trade where the price meets support and resistance is absolutely key. And it tells you exactly where um, to put your orders in. That is that is where you put you put your orders in. You put it all your, your orders in at support and resistance and make sure to put your stop loss and take profit in around those. I'll get into that more specifically just later on in the video. I also want to come to moving averages. I'm not going to go through any of the more advanced metrics in this video. Uh, metrics like um, you know RSI, MACD, um, other kind of uh, professional metrics. I go through them in my course. I'm adding those to my course as well, so they are being added over time. A ton of um, uh, professional metrics that you know you you might want to look at and are you know way more professional. I'm not going to go over that in this video. Just going to stick to the basics, which is uh, moving averages. Moving averages very simply is a moving average of the price over a certain number of time periods. So let's say you have 20 days, you know, blah, 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 blah. Each day, the price of Bitcoin will be a certain price, uh, whatever it is on that day. And then what you do is take the price and you plus them all together, divide by how many days there are, and you get an average of the price over a time period. Right, so a 20 period moving average, if you're on a one day chart, would be 20 days. What's the average price of Bitcoin uh, over 20 days? And it moves because when the next day comes, you get rid of the oldest date, uh, bring the new date in and, it, and it's moving along. Why is this important? Because the price, again, is uncanny in the way that it, it moves uh, around these moving averages. And for one reason, it's because human beings are trading this and they're using these as well. Um, but obviously the moving average, it's an average of the price and prices tend towards their averages most of the time, right? So um, just we'll, we'll stick with that for now. So the first thing is um, 20 to 50 period MA um, is kind of mid mid term, mid to short term. What you mean here is a 20 to 50 period. So if I'm looking at the one day uh, chart right here, uh, and I have a 20 period MA, which you can see right here. So how to put this on the chart, you go to technical indicator, uh, you, you type in moving average. Oh, moving, right down at the bottom, I think. Uh, moving, yeah, moving average here, right? Click that, it will go on the chart. You can choose any color you want, design you want, that's, you know, good for you. Um, but what we wanna do is um, kind of have a few, right? So you can see the longer term trend, the mid and the short term trend, and obviously this is gonna help you out. So 20 period I've got on here, 50 period and the 200 period. 50 to 100 is kind of medium term. So if you have, in fact, 100 is kind of long term, right? 200 period is definitely long term. 200 period would be 200 days. So that's kind of like a whole trading year for the stock market because um, they don't open on weekends, apparently. Apparently that's um, good for investors if you don't <laughs> don't work two days a week. But anyway, um, so <laughs> 20, 50 and um, 200 I'm using here. And you can barely see them on the chart. So I'll just uh, change this color from blue. Um, maybe light blue is better. Okay. So what we can see here. So what you see is that funnily enough, the very, very short period moving average sticks to the price a lot more. So that obviously makes a lot of sense because um, you're using a much shorter amount of uh, periods to calculate your average. And so the shorter period moving average that you have, the more closely it's gonna represent each of the, um, the moves in the price. The longer your moving average is, you're taking much more data from the past. And so it's gonna be a much less data from the present. And so it's gonna be smoothed out, out more. So what you can see here is just about is that um, the 200 period moving average in kind of gray right here, you can see it's, um, very, very different from the other moving averages, right? The the yellow short period moving average, average is um, very close to the price. So 
Um, the, the way that we, we would trade this very, very easily is when you're in an uptrend, really what you're looking for is for the price to be bouncing off the moving averages. And you can see that right here. So the 20 and 50 period moving average, you can see it was basically the support that you traded every time. So during an uptrend, what you wanna see is you wanna trade around the support level, which just so happened to be the moving average, the 50 period moving average, right? So you get this huge move up. What you wanna do is coming back to the moving average, we're in an uptrend and so what you'll see is that it bounces off the moving average up again and then it comes back to the moving average, 50 period moving average, moves up again. You wanna buy, you could have bought here when it touched the moving average, moved up, moved up again, right? So that's all bullish. When the short period moving averages are moving up through the longer period moving averages, that's bullish. It tells you the short term trade is in an uptrend versus what's happened in the past. So short term movement to the upside. For downtrends, Right, you can see that um, the moving average becomes resistance. So up here, uh, what we can see is definitely um, the price moves down through these moving averages. That's bearish, number one. You can see the price moves to the moving average. It gets rejected off the moving average. We're in a downtrend here. You sell the, the rally in a downtrend. Sell this, moves down, moves back to the um, moving average and it gets sold off again, moves down. So in a downtrend, moving averages become resistance and not support. So that's how moving averages work. Now you can use them very simply and just say, um, I won't trade long if the price is below the 200 MA because that's telling me that the price is below previous levels and so we may be in a downtrend. Or I only go long when the price is above the 200 period MA because that tells me we're in a, in a bull market. Um, I would say that that's generally okay. It it does cut your, the amount of trade um, out. For example, you know the price went through the 200 MA here, and I would have said that that was actually a pretty good time to start trading um, right here when the price is moving up through it uh, before it moves through it. So you know some people only go long when you're above the 200 MA, but I think you do miss out on a lot of opportunities. Um, but certainly, what I would say is. A move up through the 200 MA is, is kind of uh, bullish in a sense, right? So what you saw here was the short shorter term periods moving up. That tells me a potential reversal and something that I might want to get into, right? So they're moving up, they're kind of bullish, um, and then they kind of, you know, consolidate and then move up again. So that would be, for me, quite a decent move up. So what I would have done is traded below the 200 MA and not above it because I would have missed out this one. Um, so you can use moving averages very simply to show you areas on the chart, where the chart might go, where the chart might find support and where the chart might find resistance and then draw your some of your trend lines on as well. It's amazing how just trend lines and moving averages can actually um, shape your trade and give you a ton of opportunities. Very simple, but very effective. Also, before you start trading, you need to decide what type of trader you are. When it comes to day trading, there's really kind of two main ones for me. One is scalping or intraday trading, and one is day or swing trading. I kind of see them as the same thing. I kind of put them into to one bucket. You have to know what type you are first in order to decide on what strategy you're using in terms of stop loss, take profits, the amount that you're trading um, and the amount of time that you wanna spend. Intraday trading, also known as scalping, is uh, something that people do. There's a few uh, benefits and, con and, and kind of cons to this. The first is that when you trade intraday, you're gonna have a lot less of your money at risk because intraday movements are much, much smaller. Um, and so because the percentage price movement is smaller, um, you don't have to, you, you don't have as much at risk in terms of the percentage moves that can happen. So that's number one. Um, so if you are starting out, you may want to trade intraday so that the percentage price movement is a lot less and you can just try it out. The other benefit is that there's no overnight risk. So when you carry a position for a long time, obviously the longer you carry something, the more prone it is to two things. One is uh, events that you haven't foreseen and the other is just much larger price movements, right? If you hold something for 10 minutes, it can only move a certain amount in price, not a lot. If you hold something for 10 years, it can move thousands of percent, right? So time is obviously uh, risk, right? Time is risk when it comes to opening trades. When you day trade an intraday trade, the kind of macro, um, you you kind of, you don't have to um, play as much attention to the macro because 
as long as you know that there aren't crazy macro events happening on that day, then really what you're trading for like a period of an hour is basically the, the short-term trades of other people trying to scalp in and out. The real downside for this is that I just think human beings um, can't can't um, p consistently make money like this. It takes you, it takes a long period of time, right? Eight hours a day. Sit in the sit in front of the market for eight hours a day and try and scalp. It's incredibly hard. It takes a t ton of work. It takes a lot of time, and the re and the rewards are small. The risk is smaller, but the, so is the reward. Um, and it just takes a lot of work, constantly trading in and out, paying trading fees, trying to you know trying to make a a small turn every single time. So you know what I would suggest maybe is try and use trading bots to just do this. It's just so much easier. Just set them up. Just be like, hey, trade between this level and this level, and trade you know when the volume and the volatility goes, um, you know, and, and pay that out. I'll talk about trading bots later on in the video. Um, I'll also link some videos down in the description um, to trading bots if you want to see the videos on how they work and everything like that um, and also in my crypto course I have uh, specific videos and guides on trading bots um, how they work from a technical perspective and everything like that um, so you might want to check that out but yeah for intraday scalping I would use a bot it's just too much work to try and muck around for like too little money really for me personally what I would, you know, do much more readily is day or swing trading, right? So trade over two days, you know, trade over a week, right? Um, I just think this is slightly better um, from, from a, you know, a point of view of putting in buys and sells yourself if you're not using a bot, right? So what you want to do is kind of capture a market swing between areas of value. So, you know, like I've showed you on the chart tons of times, right? Areas of value... Here, this is a low. You know, this is obviously an area of support. Try and try and um, get in at a swing. You've seen the trend right here. You've seen the trend right here. These are swings in the market. You know, you might hold this for like three weeks or something. Um, you know, that that for me really is day trading. Um, that's what I call trading or you know trading day trading right. Investing buy and hold for ten years. Trading. I've got a specific plan of buying at this price, setting a stop loss at the, the this price below and setting a take profit here based on the technical analysis that I've done. That is what I think trading is. And I think that's really what most people should gravitate towards. If you want to scalp, use a trading bot, like use technology to help you. Um, you have a much larger at-risk position usually because you hold it for longer and so the potential price movement, um, but you can make way more as a percentage um, and put your stop loss in there. It's probably going to be a little bit bigger, but yeah, the, Definitely, like the longer you hold a position, macro, economy, jobs, figures, everything like this, gonna is gonna um, play in way more into your thinking. Um, you may cut your profit short though. When you trade, you usually find a technical level to take your trade out and and, and take your profit, hopefully. Um, but obviously, you know, if you just bought Bitcoin ten years ago and just held it until now, you would have made the most money, right? So, yeah. Day trading has uses, but also investing has uses. You know, I would not day trade with my whole account. That's crazy. But you can, you know, you can definitely uh, try and take um, advantage of kind of more, um, you know, short term opportunities, as I would say it. Next, I want to come to trade entry. Once you've done some technical and fundamental analysis, once you've put some trend lines on the chart and some uh, found some areas of value, let's go through and actually enter our trade. And these are the three steps that I will go through. Firstly is following the trend. There's actually two parts to this. The first part is the trend in the market. What is the market doing? What is the economy doing? What are the jobs figures doing? What is the inflation figures and interest rates doing? What is the Fed doing? What is the general feel of the market right now? Is the market selling off because of a piece of news? Is the market um, you know, going up because of a piece of news? That's the first thing. The second part of this, 1B, is just to look on the chart itself so this would be fundamental and this would be technical, right? So fundamental analysis and technical analysis. Um, on the chart, you can follow the trend. Very simply, just use moving averages, um, look at the chart as well and say, hey, is this in an uptrend? Is this in a general uptrend? What is happening here? Um, I would look at both long-term and short-term and, and kind of use both of these together 
and come up with a plan of saying, this is what I think will happen now, right? Because unfortunately, you can't use technical analysis and say, hey, this is going to happen because TA told me so. It doesn't work like that, okay? <clears throat> you need to make a subjective call at the end of the day based on fundamental and technical analysis, <clears throat> and then you have to go and take that risk. The next is finding the price level, okay? So the first is follow the trend. Second is uh, find the price level and the areas of value. What I mean by this, and I'll, I'll go through this in um, later on in the video as well, is find the areas of value as in the support and resistance. This is what you trade off when you're day trading, support and resistance. It's the only thing we can go on to actually get the specific price levels we need to go ahead and trade. <clears throat> so that's number two. The next one is to find your entry. This is the real day trading stuff, finding the candles <clears throat> and reading the market, right? The candles tell us where the market is, where actual traders are. They will tell us who's buying, who's selling, and who's winning out of those. That is your order entry specifically for the candles around where you want to enter, right? So the general trend, the area of value, more specific, find your entry the most specific. If the candles are looking good and they're saying, um, it, you know, if the candle is a bullish candle or print something, you think, yes, I think, the tra I think one area, either buyers or sellers will win, then obviously go that way. So that is really it. Okay, so the first one, follow the trend. Is it over or under the 100 period moving average? So we can see right here, I've actually got the 200 period moving average. This is the long term trend. It's below. Okay, so firstly, I would say we're in a downtrend. <clears throat> so going long is possible, but I would look for some bullish crosses, okay? So you can see right here, the price moves through the 200 period moving average. That's known as a bullish crossover. You can also see that the um, the 50 period is also moving through the 200 period. That's known as a bullish crossover, right? Short-term trend, short-term price action, moving through the longer-term trend is bullish short-term. So that's when, that's a bullish signal. So you go long then, right? You would have done extremely well. When you see this market crossing through, this is a bearish signal probably go bearish at this time it's not that simple though there are many times where the chart will consolidate around these areas and so it's much more difficult to trade but really you have to uh, uh, you know from the first step say okay i'm gonna have to find some sort of trend um to help me uh, so that's the first thing look at look at those bullish crossovers right bullish and bearish crossovers um and that's that's really the first thing and that ties in with your fundamental analysis right so what's happening here right now is we're obviously in a downtrend but we're seeing a nice pickup in the price right here because of some decent um some decent rhetoric out of the fed after some very bad rhetoric right so we just get a little pump right here are we going to keep in this downtrend or are we going to cross over if we cross over we've actually crossed over two of the moving averages so far both the 20 and the 50 now we're just looking at the 200 is it going to cross over that you could go um you could go long down at this level um try and wait for the crossover or you could wait for the crossover itself and might maybe try and ride a, a bigger move um, and that feeds into the next uh, the next slide, which is finding these areas of value. Once you're looking at the trend, you have to find the areas of value on the chart, right? It's absolutely vital because this is the only thing that's going to tell us how to trade. So you get the um, you get the you know, the trend lines on, and you find these areas of value. This is a massive area of value down here. I'm going to draw the support on the chart. You can definitely see that support, right? You can see it bounced off here hard and went up to an all-time high, and it's bouncing off this level again. This is an area of value. Find the next one. I can definitely see um, I'm going to pick the next area of value which is probably this one right here you can see that uh, resistance and support was met at that level a couple of times right um, let me zoom in support resistance broke broke through this is another level basically got a, a repeat of this one right so is it going to do the same thing that would be one of the most mega trades in history um you know that would be awesome but obviously it's not going to repeat right so get the next level on why not right so see see where we are so the next one right here i can see the next area of value absolutely around this level here you can see that um, you can see there's some support around this level here. It turns into resistance, kind of support and resistance again. Massive uh, resistance um, at this level. You can see that. Um, huge support around here. Um, support again, but it broke through. These are the three levels that I trade off right now. It took me literally 30 seconds, whatever it was. These are the three levels I'll be trading at. So um, what you'll see down here, that is the areas of value that I'm trading at, right? So these are the three prices. So we've got 41.1. 43.8 um, and this one's about 47.2 those are the three levels 
Next, find your entry. Okay, so look at the candles. Is there a pattern playing out? So what I want to um, highlight really, um, let's see if we can zoom into this chart. Um, now I made a video about this for the crypto course um, on trading and looking at candles and I actually put this together as a trade. Um, so, you know, this was a, a good trade, right? So 41, 41 or sort of 42-ish um, to 43, 44. Great trade, a couple of days made about, you know, four or five percent. Um, if you're using leverage, that'd be, you know, eight percent, ten percent in a couple of days. Pretty good, pretty good trade. Um, but there's many things to go through here. So what I would, um, what I would say, this candlestick is really important. We had a huge sell-off in the market. You can see that, right? We're all coming down. But at this key level, this area of value, 40,000, it is obviously a, a big price level, right? 40K is a big price level. And what you see is this candle right here. This is the, the reason why I went, um, or I did a video on this looking at a, a potential trade long, right? Because you just get a really bullish candle. You get a massive sell-off down to 39 intraday. Look at all this volume down here. Huge volume, massive sell-off. But they just bought back in. See the wick? They pushed it right back up, up to 41. This told me that 40K is an extremely, extremely important level of support. We've got massive support here, massive support here. The candle itself, when we wicked down to 39, rejected any move down past 40. That gives me a big a level of confidence to enter the trade. I know that there are buyers at 39.7, 39.9 that will push it up above this 40. See it tested once, twice, three times, they really tried to push it and it got rejected again. That gives me absolute confidence that 40,000 is a big area of support. And so what I can do is go long here and put my stop loss just underneath this level because I'm confident there are a lot of buyers around this level, which means <clears throat> that uh, 40,000 probably won't be tested and we may move higher again. Huge amount of buying came in at this level and it pushed the price up a couple of times and then we get this move up. So you put your buy in here, right? And you have a small downside right here, but because of the next area of value that it will move to, probably because a lot of buyers are in here, you push up to like 43, 44, that is your trade. Um, so that is the three steps that I'd wanna go through, right? So there, firstly, find the trend, find the area of value, and then find your entry. I wanna go over some risk management techniques. Trading is about risk only. It's not about making money, it's not about profits. They come. You'll see the levels that you're gonna, you're gonna make when you do your analysis. Trading is about managing risk and making sure that you don't blow up your account. It's as simple as that. It's not about making money. Look how much I can make. Well, I'm going to make loads of money. You know, getting all of that emotional stuff in. It's just not about that. It's about managing risk, knowing how much you're going to lose if the trade goes against you, and then knowing exactly how much you're going to win because of the analysis that you've done. It really is as simple as this. FOMO and FUD, just get, get out, all right? This is emotional stuff and you just can't be emotional. You have to do your analysis on the chart, put your price levels in, and then manage your risk properly. Um, something also important to know is that different approaches can make th money in the market. You might be a, a long only guy going long dips, that can work. There may be a guy that only goes short, that can work as well. It really is all about timing and managing risk. Because if you, are, if you stay in the game and only lose a small amount when you lose, then you can just plod away at the market. Day trading is about catching trends. So this is market trends out, you know, what's happening in the market? Is the market feeling good today? Is it is this week gonna be a good week, right? And then suddenly you you just, you, you get in and you think, no, I think the sentiment's gonna change. So this actually takes a lot of, um, of work overall, but it's really important to do. Also important to know is that you absolutely will, will lose money, right? You have to have this, you have to, um, understand this first before you get in, you will lose money. Everyone loses money when they day trade because you can't predict the future. You just do not know what's going to happen. The only thing that you can do is manage your risk, manage your downside, and let the wins take care of themselves. It's the only thing you can do. I put these lines on the chart. These are my price levels to go off. All of the emotion or everything else has gone. It's not there. I know the price levels here. It's very, very simple now. I go long at this bottom price level. I try and reach it up to this second trend line. If I think that the sentiment in the market is fairly good, I'll try and ride it through to this third trend line. If not, I cut my trade, I take my profit and I move on to the next one. There is no, there, there is just no room for anything else, right? This is just absolutely clinical. You have to be that way. Day trading is a battle with yourself more than anything else, to be honest, and also the market. 
I want to come to risk management. Okay, this is just this is the whole point. Um, this is supposed to be a K, okay. risk reward ratio. When you go into a trade, if it doesn't look good from this standpoint, an RRR point, then just don't go into it. It's not the right trade, move on and, and wait. So you don't have to trade every day when you're day trading. Okay, so really get the risk reward ratio in the right place. If it looks like a good trade, then we can move on. So really, how much do you put at risk for that potential reward. What I mean by this is, I've already done my analysis. Here are the price levels. How much am I risking down here at this level versus the potential reward up to this first trend line in the middle? So what I would say is that to have a risk reward ratio of around 1.5 to one or two to one is good, right? So for every dollar that you risk, you're hopefully making you know one and a half, two dollars plus. That would be that would be pretty good as a trade, right? Somewhere around that level, I would say is pretty good, right? So every, for every one, let's call it a you know percent, right? For every one percent potentially that you may lose, that potential upside um, is 1.5, two times that. What do I mean by potential upside? Let's look at the chart. I've done my analysis. These are the three key price levels that I'm looking at: the support right here, the first resistance, and the second resistance. These are my potential reward areas and my potential loss. Where is my potential loss? Well, we've not been down here since this level, and I believe that the bottom here has been bought into a lot. So all I'm going to do is take my potential reward in percent and then set a stop loss a little bit below so that my risk reward is around that ratio or better, right? 1.5 or 2 to 1. It's very simple and effective to do it this way. Trading is only about risk. It is only about risk. Trading, investing, buying risk assets is only about managing your risk and nothing else. What I would say also is if you have a portfolio and everyone's got a different portfolio, right? So whatever it is, it doesn't matter. We can just deal in percentages, right? If you've got a $10,000 portfolio that you want to use for day trading, and I assume you've got a HODL portfolio for the long term that's much more than that, um, you know, for the long term, whatever you want to trade with, it doesn't matter. Let's, let's go in percentages. You want to risk one or two percent of that as your downside, right? So if you're trading with 10,000, what we want to do is take about one to 2% um, as the potential loss per trade. So what I mean by this is if you're trading Bitcoin and you're trading up at highs and you, uh, right, and there's no stop loss in place, you just got no stop loss. You're like, no, no, it's going to be fine. I don't, don't, don't need a stop loss, right? We were at all time highs. It's going to you know, go up forever no stop loss and it comes down, you're like, oh, I don't need a stop loss. Like, no way, man. I'm just, you know, I'll, I'll ride it out. It's gonna go up again, comes down again. Oh man, okay. Well, I'm losing a lot of money now. Like I can't cut my losses now, right? I'm already losing, you know, like, man, like 10,000, you know, per Bitcoin. This is, I'm just gonna have to keep, like run it now, right? Oh man, look at this sell off. Oh my, like, whew, okay. I'm like, I'm done, right? Like I had no stop loss. I'm losing my money, right? For day trading, this is absolute disaster. If your HODL portfolio, just let it run, right? That is your HODL portfolio, you're not touching it. But when you're day trading, the whole point is to stay in the game, right? And say, do you know what? Actually, even if you went long at the top, which you're like, who goes long at the top, right? But to just say that you did and you had to stop loss in place, you would lose a couple of percent and then you could go again and you say, you know what, actually, um, I'm thinking going short here because we're crossing through bearish crossover. Maybe go short. I'm still in the game. If you're still in the game, you can maybe go short and actually you know, start making money again. You have to stay in the game. So only risk one to 2% of your portfolio per time. This is you know, typical. You're going to lose a lot, but when your wins come, as long as they are, for example, double of your losses, you're gonna stay in the game and rack up. So yeah, what I wanna to come to is, um, uh, a, a good site really that you can use to um, just work out like how much risk that you have, right? So uh, this is, um, I don't know the name of the site, but you, you can look uh, crypto position size calculator. It's gonna come up. Uh, sorry, but you're not on it there. So this is it. Um, you can choose the, basically, you know, every asset. So we've got Bitcoin USD, deposit currency USD. This is the price. What's the stop loss price? Um, so what I wanna do is um, show you right here. So what we're going to do, come over to the chart and let's reset the chart. 
So we came in around this level. So let's say we're in at um, 42,000. I'm gonna go 42,000. Back. So what I'm doing right now is basically looking at the chart that we draw the, the lines on, right? Um, so this is the, the Bitcoin chart. And I was saying we wanna go in at this level. Don't know where the trend lines have gone, but they've all disappeared. So um, we wanna go in at this level. And what I'm saying is, this is a massive area of support. So what I'm gonna do is set my stop loss down, down here around 40,500, because I think that that's the bottom. So you come around here, 40,500, your account balance is 10,000, right? And you want to risk 2% of your balance. Calculate that. That is gonna tell you how much Bitcoin you can trade, right? So your position size now, when you go long, you wanna go long 0.133 Bitcoin. If the trade moves against you and you are dead wrong and the price goes to zero, you only lose 2% of your portfolio, you can stay in the game. So this gives you um, an amount that you trade, right? Here's your portfolio balance, you're risking 2%. Now, if I change this stop loss to a wider stop loss, much lower, you can see that the amount that I can trade goes down, right? So if I change this to say 39, calculate again, I can trade a much smaller amount of Bitcoin. Why is that? Because the stop loss is further away, so I'm making a bigger loss, but I only want to put 2% of my portfolio at risk with this, and you can see the amount that I trade is much smaller. If I have a much tighter stop loss, like 41,900, um, something like that, you can trade more, um, two, two Bitcoin, you can trade more uh, because you, you're, you, the amount that you lose from the trade is, is smaller. So that is kind of managing your risk to say, do you know what, um, I can only trade this amount because if it does go against me, then you know I only lose 2% and your winners, if they do run, you can just click through them. So uh, step one, stop loss, take profit are determined by technical analysis. Okay, so we go over to the chart, like I've drawn those lines on those three lines, technical analysis shows you the price levels. Next, only trade if the risk reward ratio is kind of 1.5 to one, two to one, something like that. If you think it's more, then, you know, great. If it is more, then potentially it's a more volatile um, asset and your stop loss might have to be a bit lower as well, depending on the technical analysis. Um, so obviously you may, you may have to trade a smaller amount, right? Um, so the more volatile something is, the smaller you may have to trade to keep that um, percentage, you know, um, you know, probable loss in check. The position size is determined by your risk management, right? So we've just seen that. This is really important. This risk management is just absolutely key uh, to stay in the game. Everything is done to manage your risk, to stay in the game over the long term and to manage your positions so that when you lose, it's not a big deal and you move on to the next trade. Something else we want to come to is trading bots. I've gone through day trading in this video, you know, how to set up, how to look at levels, how to do everything, all the kind of techniques I used when I was a broker, um, you know, how to day trade. This is really the theory of everything. Now, cryptocurrency is about using technology to just do things better, cheaper, faster, quicker, you know, and easier. Um, and with cryptocurrency, you can use trading bots. This is something you can't really do in the equities market. Um, you know, you just don't have access to it. But with crypto, for now, you do have access to trading bots and they can really help you out, to be honest, and actually just day trade for you um, without you having to go through all of the emotion, all of the nonsense of having to keep up with the markets, which is like a daily thing. Um, so I want to come to basically the two that I have used in the past and, and use is Pionex and KuCoin. I believe these are probably the best trading bots out there um, in terms of uh, what they give um, and the way they're set up. They both have really fantastic apps, smartphone apps. I'll link them below if you want to sign up. Um, you can just go through, sign up and, and you know have a look around with both of them. You don't need to put any money on account. Um, so really, you know, I, I just want to go through the very fundamental um, type of bots, right, which is a grid bot. Now, when we day trade, what we're essentially doing when you day trade, short term trading is taking advantage of market volatility. So you're not you're not thinking about the long term growth of Bitcoin or Ethereum's going through this and that and the other. You're just saying, I think based on technical analysis that I can make the difference between the, the short-term volatility in the market. That's all you're doing. Well, how about a bot to do that? 
So a bot can do things that a human can't. And the, the one really, the, one of the main ones for day trading is called grid trading. Grid trading, and I'll explain this in a second, but there's different types. You can have a futures grid, a leverage grid, which is basically the same as a futures grid, right? And then a re reverse grid, which is when you go short, you have a short bias rather than a long bias. Using futures, um, like I may have said in this tutorial or this video, um, futures are a little bit cheaper to trade, so you're not paying as much in fees. Um, and you can go short as a bias, where you can't do that in the spot market. Spot market is only long bias. Um, so there's some advantages, but there are also some disadvantages, like you can potentially get wiped out when using futures and leverage, which you can't do in the spot market. In the spot market, you know, if the price falls, you just end up buying some crypto and then, you know, hopefully holding it until at some point it moves up again. With futures, it's not really like that. You have to manage your position the whole time. Um, reverse grid, like I said, uses futures to go short, have a short bias. When you use a grid trading bot, you are definitely open to market risk. Okay, so if the price falls, you will be at risk and you will be losing money. Um, but you can, you can go long and short with the futures trading bots. So you definitely are open to risk, but actually what the grid bot does is actually extract yield from the volatility of the trade in the asset. It's quite clever how it does it. You still are open to risk, but there are some um, kind of good pros um, of using these bots. Basically what they do is trade at high frequency. So they put a load of orders in between two price levels. And then when the price moves up and becomes volatile, you basically buy low, sell higher, refresh the bids. You know, when it comes down again, you buy. And then when it moves up, you're selling. You just can't do this. You can't trade like high frequency trading as a person. It's basically like scalping, right? It's a bot that scalps volatility up and down. It does it all day long, 24 hours a day. So you just try and extract yield from the volatility. Um, it may trigger capital gains tax for you depending on where you live. So just to keep that in mind. This is the KuCoin bot and I'm up on the, the, you know, the KuCoin trading system here. I'm going to show you on the screen because it's easier. Um, the app is, is really good as well. So you can just download the app. Um, like I said, link in description. Bitcoin USD. I'm just going to use the AI parameters because I want to explain the bot. So what it does is it takes the low price, which is 30K, the high price, which is 56K. So it puts in, what it's doing is it put it's putting in um, 30K as a low and 50, let's call it 57 as a high. So that is your lower and upper bound of the grid. Okay, so Bitcoin is gonna be somewhere in between that. Then what you do is you place 100 orders in between that grid. What it's gonna do is in between these prices, place a hundred different orders known as grids, buys and sells. Okay, so each one is a grid and you can see each grid is um, a 0.3 to 0.69 profit after the fee because they, char they charge a trading fee, right? So each grid is around 0.4 of a percent in size, that would be a grid. You, you buy low and sell high. So the price is moving around, right? That would be one grid, that would be the grid finished, and you would extract the profit from that and it would go into your trading account. So what, what essentially happens is that this just trades all day long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, between 30 and 57K. If the price of Bitcoin starts here, you'll buy some, moves down, you'll buy some more, moves down, you'll buy some more, moves up, you'll sell that grid, this grid right here that you've just bought and sold, right? Then it moves up again. And this grid, which is from here to here, you sell that and then so on. When it moves down, you refresh that previous bid at that level. So you get hit again, you buy some here, right? You, 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 refresh, you refresh the bid, bid down at this level, buy some again, moves up, you sell it, moves up, you sell it. So it's constantly, it's not just saying, hey, I'm going to put 100 orders in, and I hope you sell. It's const constantly refreshing bids and offers the entire time as the price moves. Um, and you, you can just see it the whole way. So what essentially this is doing is um, moving, uh, re extracting yield from, uh, from the market in addition to the price movement. So I want to show you a couple uh, or three bots I've got running here that I'm basically doing for a video just to show how they work. Um, now, what you can see here is actually, I think this has worked out pretty great. 
um, for the video, so, that, so that's nice, I guess. But what I've done here is opened um, trading bots for ETH. This is on Pionex, by the way. I'll leave that link in the description. Um, you can, uh, Pionex is a great app, like on the smartphone, it's really good. There's manual trading, everything. Um, you know, check it out if you want. Um, but I'll show you it on, on here just so you can see. This is METH. This is basically a thousandth of an ETH. Just makes it easier to trade small amounts. So I've got a thousand bucks here, thousand in Matic, uh, 1200 in ADA. Really great, I wanna, I wanna show you this. So essentially what you can see is I entered these trades and then the price fell down. So what's happened is instead of me just losing money as the price has come down, what's happened is that all of these uh, bots have put in ratcheted bids all the way down. And so basically I've been buying at lower prices all the way down, right? But then it has volatility as well. So what you can see here on this Matic grid is that it would have gone buy, 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 and then we, as we move up, sell, sell, and then buy, buy here, sell on that spike, sell on that spike, buy down here and sell on these spikes. And then as we're moving up, basically you're getting rid of other um, uh, coins that you got here, right? So you can see that all of these are actually underwater in terms of the price of the asset when I went in and when it is now. But what you can see is that the grid is actually extracting yield. So what you can see is that the grid profit is 13 right here, which is a 1% on the day. So I've made 1% on the day. The annualized rate is a 30% yield from uh, the grid bot. So that is separate to the move in ADA, right? So even though ADA is down, I've actually made uh, 13 from the grid bot that I wouldn't have made if I just hold, held the asset. So it's extracting profit and loss all the time, putting that into your account uh, away from this, right? So it's it's um, extracting yield. You can see on Matic, I've almost uh, also made 13.8, not doing anything, not trading, 1.48% today, annualized uh, around 40% um, based on the the uh, performance so far from the bot over, the, over a few weeks. That's a 40% yield out, out from day trading Obviously the actual asset itself, and if that goes up as well, then you make that as well. So it's actually down a little bit. So you can see, you know, 40% yield, I'm gonna start turning into a profit, even if the price of the asset falls below my entry price. After a few, after a few days, because of this grid extracting yield, I'm gonna be up even though my, my, the price now is slightly below my entry price. If it moves up, you're going to be setting grids higher. So it's just a way to day trade and extract yield out of volatility. You can see the grid profit here is 7.69, 20% annualized rate. So what do I think of um, grid bots really? You know, do I think they're, they're great? Do I think I should put my whole portfolio in? I don't think so. There's a few things to consider. Firstly, um, you know, when you're trading, obviously your assets are on this exchange. Um, and not in a cold storage, you're not staking, anything like that. And obviously you are still open to market risk and that is the same if you hold um, the asset or not, right? So for me, I think as a, if you're trading anyway and if you've got a trading part of your portfolio that you wanna day trade with, you know, why not use some of these bots to help you out, right? They are just extracting yield from the volatility much better than I can do absolutely much better than I can do. Would I put all of my money in here? No, I just think that, you know, it's probably good to just hold some anyway, right? Not have it at risk or, you know, not kind of have it trading around and just say, that's kind of my main portfolio. But if you're using some anyway, I think there's definitely some advantages to a grid bot. Um, now, the one thing that I would note, kind of the downside of, of grids is that you have to have a bottom and a lower, or a lower and an upper grid. And so what will happen is that eventually this grid will stop working if the price range falls out of the set price range. If it does that, then basically the grid will stop trading for you. It will only trade in this price range. And so what that means is that you have to be slightly more active in your management of it. Um, and obviously some people don't want that, right? Some people just wanna buy and hold. They just wanna to add to their portfolio over time. Um, and that's kind of the, the downside of bots is that it is more a day trading thing, right? So you need to have an amount of money and say, this is what I wanna trade. I wanna kind of see how it goes, actively manage it. If the price falls out, um, cancel the bot 
re, you know, redo the bot and everything like that. So it's definitely um, more active in terms of the way that you can manage things. Um, but that is day trading as well, to be honest. So, you know, I would say, um, yeah, definitely have a look at them and they, the grid bot at least can help you out. You might've seen me flick through to best tips there. So I wanna go through some just very simple tips um, when getting into trading that you might wanna think about. Um, so the first one is really Bitcoin and Ethereum are the most traded for a reason, right? So the most of the information that affects Bitcoin and Ethereum is open market information. There are no insiders for Bitcoin. Everybody knows most things about Bitcoin, right? So the market has analyzed Bitcoin, everything's out in the open and everything is known. Everyone knows who the holders are, um, you know, or who they are. They know the wallets, right? There's no insiders controlling Bitcoin. That is why people love to trade this. It is a fair and open playing field. And Ethereum for the most part is, is, is that as well, right? When you start getting down to small altcoins, they will be heavily impacted by specific news and events for that altcoin. The problem with altcoins and day trading altcoins is you just don't know. There is a ton of stuff, especially when you start getting down to small altcoins. There are insiders, there are things going on that you won't know. Um, people can control how you know the, the coin issuance works and everything like that that's out of your control and it's very hard to know. So that's why most people will trade these big assets because you're on a level playing field. Definitely think about the macro trends first. How's the market doing? What's the sentiment like? Um, you can go to CNBC, you can go on Twitter, just feel it, right? That's gonna impact the market a lot. What I would suggest also is starting very, very small if you want to day trade. You don't have to day trade to make money. I believe the best money in the market is made by investing over the long term, picking a very, very good project that's gonna be around in 10 years and just letting it ride. I believe that's the best way to really make lots of money over the long term, investing um, over the long term, putting money in slowly, dollar cost averaging um, over the long term. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, I would, would suggest my crypto course. I really go way more into, I have a massive day trading section in that, but I also go into uh, investing, you know, using my knowledge from from being a stockbroker and being an investment manager, really to uh, um, you know kind of put that over to crypto. So you can see my course here, you know, how to analyze um, investments, on chain analysis, doing your own research for projects. Yes, a huge day trading section, but come down the DeFi section. This is how you earn yield on your investments, how to think about earning yield, all this about different investing techniques, um, how to manage you know, risk and volatility, how to set up a big portfolio over time, over the long term to really grow your wealth. If that sounds like something you might be interested in, check out the course. Uh, I'll leave it linked in the description. We have private Discord groups where people talk about all of these different things, different opportunities, different coins, trading, investing. Um, you can see my portfolio and trade alerts in there as well. So if you're looking at investing and day trading, that might be for you. But certainly when you are day trading, definitely start small and see how it goes. And risk management is the only key to invest to trading and investing. Find the areas of value that is going to give you your price levels to trade off. So see where the support and the resistance is. You, that is the only thing you have to go on when you're day trading because you're, you're day trading the chart, you're day trading the sentiment and what other traders are doing. The fundamentals are less important, you know, uh, and you need to find those areas of value on the chart to give you your risk management and say, is this good or to go into or not? Uh, don't chase gains. You may not trade for weeks. Day trading is extremely unreliable as an income source. Day trading for me is a small part of the portfolio that you can use to supplement or you know try and kind of extract some extra yield out of the market. Keep your skills sharp, right? Keep keep at it, keep in the market, keep feeling the market because when you trade, you can feel the market more because obviously your senses are heightened. So you know. Um, a lot of investors will have 10% you know, of their portfolio or 5% or whatever it is, 2% to, to, to short-term trading and opportunities just to kind of fill the market. And it is honestly, it's extremely, extremely unreliable as an income source. If you're under the impression that you can day trade and you know make money regularly, it's incredibly difficult unless you have a very, very large portfolio, um, you know, investing and you know earning you yield as well, right? Um, yeah, make it a very small part of your portfolio 
and one entry and exit price. So get your entry um, and your exit price in your head, take profit and stop loss um, before you trade, and then just let the trade run out. You know, um, best not to kind of change the trade midway through. There are some things you can do as you get more experience for sure, um, so like moving your stop loss up or um, other things that you can do when you're more advanced. But as a beginner, I would say, you know, definitely just get your stop loss, take profit in and let the trade uh, run out. I hope this mini course is really helpful for you and gets you up to speed uh, with day trading crypto and some of the techniques. Everything I mentioned in the video, the trading platforms, the bots and everything, I'll leave them linked in the description. My crypto course as well, if you wanna find that out. Some other specific videos and other tutorials I'll leave down there as well um, to get you started, including platform tutorials um, and some other helpful videos about charting and everything. So look in the description if you want to go on and watch even more of me, probably not. But I'm James with Money CG. cheers for watching and I'll see you in the next next one.